Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a patient who came in with chest pain and shortness of breath, about 55 years old. Here are the unenhanced CT images of the chest which were obtained. IV contrast enhanced images also were obtained. Now when we start from the top down, see if something catches your eye. If anything looks abnormal there, that's very good if you can detect this relatively subtle abnormality here. And the abnormality is this crescentic high attenuation that is between 50 and 60 Hounsfield units. You see, you don't see anything like that in the perimeter of other vessels or in the descending aorta. This is the ascending aorta. Let's follow it down a little bit more. Now it's becoming a little more conspicuous. Smoothly marginated crescentic. You see how it tapers at each end of this crescent-like structure. So this is the ascending aorta, and this is the wall of the ascending aorta in that area. Now we're really getting a very well demarcated, defined view of the this mural process, this high attenuation in the wall of the aorta and it's a little more conspicuous now. Okay, and I'm going down still slowly and you can really see on some of these images very clearly, for example right here, just how high attenuation this area is compared with the lumen of the aorta. So how high attenuation is it? We will see that it is 59 Hounsfield units, just about 60 Hounsfield units, which is very typical of hemorrhage. Uh, hemorrhage can be any of a variety of attenuations, depending on how much it has been diluted uh, by water or other serous fluids. But this is pretty dense, so this is close to pure hemorrhage. about 60 Hounsfield units, and you can see it getting a little thicker here. Still has that crescentic shape. It's most prominent and most dense in this area. Okay, and here we have the, the uh, left ventricle is here, and I'm giving away some of the secrets of this case now. Here's a calcification. Where is that? It's an intimal calcification in the ascending aorta. So let's look and see what we see on these images. You can see that there is an abnormality here next to the heart. Here if we go through this part you can see this is cardiac structures. And since we know that this is the ascending aorta. We follow that backward and it should take us to the left ventricle. And sure enough, here it is. You can see the thick myocardial wall of the left ventricle. And that ejects the blood through the aortic valve into the ascending aorta. And we see some intimal calcification here in the ascending aorta, in the wall of the ascending aorta. And it's right about there that we start seeing this high attenuation uh, crescentic region forming in the wall of the ascending aorta, right lateral aspect. So this is the aorta here. This is a mural hematoma. It is hemorrhage that has occupied not the subintimal space, which would make it an intimal dissection, which is much more common than this. This is an, an aortic mural hematoma, so the wall of the aorta, the media of the aorta, the layers being the intima, media, and adventitia, adventitia being the most peripheral. This media has hemorrhage in it now, and it is therefore not only more dense, but it is thicker. 
Okay, so we have a mural hematoma of the ascending aorta. What else do we have? Well, something is abnormal here. This is kind of crescent-like, but it is outside of the heart and outside of these great vessels. And this is a pericardial hematoma. So the hemorrhage in this wall of the, of the aorta, this mural hematoma, has extended through the adventitia into the pericardial sac. And that's bad enough, but in this case, it's actually causing a compression of the heart. So cardiac tamponade is the phrase we use when pressure upon the heart is compromising its ability to contract normally. And this will certainly cause the contractile forces to be diminished compared with normal. So this pericardial hematoma is creating cardiac tamponade of one extent or another by compressing on the heart, flattening it, and disturbing its normal morphology and particularly its ability to assume a larger relaxed position in diastole. So this looks like a heart in systole, contracted in other words, whereas it may well be in diastole during these images and just appears like it's contracted because this external hemorrhage, this pericardial hematoma, is compressing the heart. Okay, so that's the ascending aorta. Here's the descending aorta, and we can see the, the level of the aorta, or of the, uh, you can see here the level of the tracheal bifurcation, and the right and left main stem bronchus. Here's the esophagus. Have some tiny little nodes in here in the mediastinum. Not particularly significant. Axillary regions look normal. What else do we have here? A little bit of ground glass opacities in the lungs, which could be some mild pulmonary edema resulting from the cardiac tamponade because blood returning to the heart from the lungs may in, is going to be very likely encountering a higher pressure to overcome in order to return into the left atrium. So the backup pressure can cause this very mild patchy pulmonary edema and also the pleural effusions that we're seeing here bilaterally. And these are moderate sized pleural effusions with adjacent compressive atelectasis. Here's the descending aorta. So here is the contrast opacified images, and I'll go through those just kind of quickly here, give you an overview, see what's coming. Okay. So starting at the top, we have the thoracic trachea, the thoracic esophagus. Remember the esophagus is posterior to the trachea in the chest. Okay, and you have the great vessels up here, right, well, here's actually the venous vessels, the right brachiocephalic vein and the left brachiocephalic vein, and you can tell the patient was injected in their left arm, the left brachiocephalic vein being, being quite opacified by the IV contrast, and that would make this the brachiocephalic artery and the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. And if that's the subclavian artery, it's going to have to get over there somewhere to the arm. And sure enough, it does. The left subclavian artery goes over toward the left axilla, where it continues as the left axillary artery, and then into the left upper extremity. 
So, right brachiocephalic vein, left brachiocephalic vein, brachiocephalic artery, of which there is only one, and therefore it does not need to be named right or left. It is the brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery with the trachea and the esophagus. Now you can see the left brachiocephalic vein coming over to join the right brachiocephalic vein, and that's what we're seeing here. And that will continue. You can see that there's not complete mixing of these two different attenuation areas of blood, and therefore you can distinguish the inflow from the right brachiocephalic vein being lower attenuation than that from the left brachiocephalic vein but inferior to that they mix more fully and here you are looking at the superior vena cava and here's the esophagus the lumen of the esophagus you can see well as air containing structure here's a tracheal bifurcation where the trachea goes from one lumen and branches to make two lumens right and left main stem bronchus and this is the, therefore the tracheal bifurcation and the little vertex of this bifurcation anatomy is the carina. The carina is something that goes across at this level. And if you go down, there we go. This would be part of the carina right there. Okay, that's carina right there. That's probably the best depiction of it. Okay, and you have ascending aorta and descending aorta, and now here we see that high attenuation within the wall of the ascending aorta, and that is a mural hematoma, an aortic mural hematoma. Very rare, only case I've ever seen. And not only is it a mural hematoma of the aorta, but it has extended, as we saw before, into the pericardium, so it has broken through the exterior margin of the, of the wall of the aorta there, and some of the blood that was accumulating in the wall is now emptying into the pericardial sac. Okay, here you have the, the aortic valve, and you can see the three leaflets, kind of, a little bit here you can see that there's like three leaflets that are coming from the central aspect it may look more like two there but here's one two three go up a little higher and then we lose it and it becomes the aorta with the mural hematoma uh, what do we have here We've got vessels coming from the left, vessels coming from the right, coming from the lungs on the left and right, and joining to create this, this area which contains obviously contrast opacified blood, and this is the left atrium. So those are pulmonary veins emptying into the left atrium, which of course in turn has to empty into the left ventricle, and you can see that a little here. You see the thick wall of the left ventricle here now. And here's a very good depiction of the thick left ventricular myocardium. This is a papillary muscle. You can even see the chordae tendinia emanating from the papillary muscles here and here. Okay, and so it comes from the left atrium, which is filled by the pulmonary veins, and it empties into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle it goes almost 180 turnaround into the aortic root. So you'll see that the blood then comes from the left atrium this way, and then it immediately turns this way. So it's maybe a 30 or 40 degree angle that is there when you make that 
that turnaround. So the left atrium fills the left ventricle, and the left ventricle forces that out against the very high resistance aortic lumen pressure and perfuses the rest of the body everywhere besides the lungs. Okay, and here you can see the densely opacified blood in the SVC as it enters the left as it enters Here you can see the densely opacified contrast in the superior vena cava as it empties into the right atrium, which is here, which in turn empties into the right ventricle, which is here, and that in turn pumps the blood out the main pulmonary artery, which is this and that in turn of course branches to the right main pulmonary artery and the left main pulmonary artery. The left main pulmonary artery is more superiorly positioned than the right main pulmonary artery because the left main pulmonary artery has to go up and over this left main stem bronchus. See that relationship? Here we go down and we go up. The left main pulmonary artery has to arch up and over the left main stem bronchus whereas the right main pulmonary artery let's follow that over here courses anterior to the right main stem bronchus right main stem bronchus here right main pulmonary artery and therefore does not have to arch up and over and that's why the left main pulmonary uh, artery is a little higher. And you can see that on a chest radiograph, lateral view actually. Okay, so this wall of the left ventricular cavity has a, an aspect which constitutes the division between right ventricle and left ventricle, and that is the interventricular septum. So while this is all part of left ventricular myocardium, this specific portion here, which is between the two chambers, is the interventricular septum, comprising a portion of the ventricular myocardium. Here are the pleural effusions bilaterally with compressive atelectasis, very classic, typical appearance. And you can see that it's the little tiny part of the lung, if this is a lateral view, it's the recess, the posterior pleural recess, where the lung has been compressed by the adjacent fluid. Nice view of the sternum here. Now going back. Aha, where's the mural hematoma now? Well, it's right in here. This is high attenuation material, not as dense as the content of the aorta or the chambers of the heart, but still it's abnormally high attenuation. It should be just soft tissue or fat, and you can see here it is higher attenuation than, than that should be, and you can see the thickening effect. The aortic wall would not normally be several millimeters thick like this. This is probably five or six millimeters thickness. Here you have the calcification in the root of the aorta, right near the aortic valve. And here you can see the great vessels coming off the aortic arch, brachycephalic artery, left common carotid artery, and left vertebral artery, or rather left subclavian artery left subclavian artery in turn gives off a left vertebral artery. Let's see if we can get any luck with the, oh, the candy cane image. This is designed to be parallel with and superimposed upon 
the thoracic aorta. So you get a big question mark here. So that is the candy cane effect. And so what we're seeing then is you can see that there's no high attenuation wall around the aorta here, the thoracic aorta or the upper abdominal aorta. You go back here and there's some soft tissue next to it. But in this area right here, we see that high attenuation material in the very wall, in the mural structure of the thoracic aorta, and that's a mural hematoma. Very rare diagnosis with extension of the mural hematoma and hemorrhage into the pericardial sac.